We've had a project computer for the last few months now, actually arguably closer to a year, that's been our behind the scenes obsession as a sort of restoration project. Think of it like restoring an old hot rod, except it's a dual socket Xeon from the X79 era with a Case Labs case by a company that's now dead, and an EVGA SRX dark motherboard which has its own tragic history. After a lot of recent trips to Huachian Bay in China and some calls to manufacturers, we've managed to get this dual E5 2697V2 system up and running and compressing our video files daily. But it's far from done, clearly, because as you can see in our B-roll, it's not pretty. It is functional, however, and that means it's time to run our dual Xeon system and all of its 48 threads through our CPU test bench. One important note, all of this CPU test data is going to be older as we ran these benchmarks back in March when we built the thing originally, and it will be wiped and refreshed for the Ryzen reviews, so this won't carry forward. But we're going to go through the build process, some of the cooler parts in this machine, give a bit of history on it, and talk about the performance in the latter half of the video, but this is really more of a project PC, so let's enjoy the process of trying to get the thing to work. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA GTX 1660 XC Black video card. EVGA's GTX 1660 XC Black uses a fat heat sink to allow the card to run at lower noise levels for longer, capable of sinking more heat before the fan kicks in, and also has day one game ready drivers for game launches. The 1660 XC Black is short and compact for installation to small form factor PC builds, but if you need one that isn't extra thick, it's also accompanied by a dual fan counterpart with a thinner heatsink for standard dual slot support. Learn more at the links in the description below. This content combines a lot of cool things. We have an appearance of the tragic EVGA SRX, a board that was purpose built for overclocking the Intel Xeon CPUs, and would have been the only dual socket board really capable of it. The board has seven PCIe slots. It has a big chipset and VRM heatsink and a VRM and BIOS that were going to be prepared for overclocking. Unfortunately, the Intel Xeon CPUs of that generation ended up being locked for overclocking, and so EVGA was stuck with an overbuilt dual Xeon board that couldn't fulfill its purpose. What was meant to be EVGA's highest end board was utterly sandbagged, a luxury overclocking platform for CPUs that could not be overclocked. We also have the appearance of two high-end, once high-end, Xeons. A lot of the now very affordable ECC memory appearing as well, and an off-brand motherboard from Shenzhen. So ignoring the massive case that it's, the system's not on the table, because it's huge, ignoring the massive case, the system overall is pretty cheap. It's pretty affordable, because you can get ECC memory DDR3, which is not expensive. Server companies are dumb hit it on mass on eBay right now. And that's maybe, we might have paid 200 bucks for 1866, 64 gigabytes of memory on there. And then we also got the two CPUs. We ended up with three of them. We bought two, and then we had to ask Intel for a third one because we were troubleshooting an issue. More on that later. And those are in the range of 200 to $300 each. So you get two of them, call it, let's call it 600 bucks on the high end. Uh, and then you can find a motherboard. And these are also a couple hundred bucks max. They might be cheaper now. We bought this a long time ago, and then the content just didn't work out. But we're here today. Uh, so you can build a whole dual socket system for relatively cheap, especially compared to the original price. And that is where this idea started. It was Patrick's idea to get into. He saw this motherboard, and then nothing ever worked. And so we spent several months just kind of in our spare time tinkering with it and getting it to work. The motherboard next to me is what started it, but it's not the one that we're using currently. We wanted to pull this server together as a compression system to reduce our footprint for storage requirements for all the video files. So it does actually run actively and compress videos now. It's working properly, something that two older Xeons are actually really good at, despite the fact that today, realistically, you could buy a 9900K or a 2700X, and both would be far cheaper than even the used parts that the two CPUs used uh, with the board and the memory and all that. It would probably be cheaper to buy a modern CPU and use that if you're going to do something like gaming. It'd be far better for gaming. Frankly, a 9700K, 9600K, we'll talk about this later, uh, would blow away these two CPUs. So that's not really the purpose. But we did gaming benchmarks anyway for fun. The purpose is to see how they do with production workloads. Uh, we'll throw Premiere in there as well just because why not at this point? In one way, this content piece began more than a year ago when we picked up the Intel Xeon E5 2697V2 for use in our production machine. And we do have an old video on that as well. It was probably about $500 at the time. They are two to $300 now. It's a 12 core, 24 thread part, which for the era was very good. This is 
circa 2011 to 13 range, depending on the version of the CPU. And it was $2,618 new. So quite a discount. You knock an entire digit off of that number for the modern pricing. We didn't put much more thought than that until a few months ago when we, well, six, eight, six months ago at this point, when we bought the uh, dual socket board next to me, which is by a Chinese brand. This is Huananger. And uh, unfortunately, I can only speak and listen. I can't, I'm, I'm illiterate for Chinese characters. So you can help me out in the comments with what the characters say. But I can read the opinion. And uh, Huananger, I think, is just South China made maybe, or South China something, uh, depending on the tone of that jerk. But anyway, uh, that's the board. And it's two sockets. It's only four dim slots for a CPU that is quad channel. So it's going to be it's going to be dual channel for this board. Uh, and it's compact. So that is where we started. Technically, it's not an X79 board. It's a C600 series chipset because dual socket Xeons mean C600. X79 is for enthusiast single socket only chips like the 4960X, but X79 is the name that consumers are familiar with, hence the branding. We were interested because cheating the system by buying cheap old decommissioned Xeons is a perennially cool idea, limited only by how expensive old server motherboards are. With brand new, reasonably priced dual socket boards on the market, the idea might finally be practical. Moreover, the 2697V2 that we already owned is specifically capable of being run in dual CPU systems. So with a board and one CPU already in our possession, we were already two thirds of the way there for the build. Or so we thought. The Juan Andrew board arrived after a couple months. Then we purchased a second 2697V2 off of eBay and assembled a system. It didn't boot. Everything worked with either CPU and the primary socket, but nothing could persuade the system to boot with both sockets filled. There's an LED display with postcodes, but since it's a Chinese board with no manual that was presumably assembled from repurposed server hardware and most of the instructions were in Chinese, which again, can't read the characters, we didn't know where to look up the postcodes. Any code tables that we did manage to find would list that code as, quote, reserved for future use. Ominous. Normally, we have more than enough hardware to replace one part at a time and figure out the problem, but we only had two of the LGA 2011 Xeons and one dual socket board to test with, and a whole lot of question marks. Our original CPU, the one we used for editing, was an Intel engineering sample that we bought on eBay. You aren't supposed to sell engineering samples, but someone did. Normally, that'd be fine, but the S spec of the consumer and sample CPUs are different, and that could be causing some kind of problem in a system that's looking for two identical processors. The solution here would be to buy yet another S, or well, an S spec SR19H. The Juan Anger board might not be compatible with Ivy Bridge EP processors at all, was another one of our thoughts, something that we were able to validate later. Compatibility lists for the board we bought were limited to whatever the reseller happened to test. So even though the socket matches and the C602 chipset can't support the CPU, we thought it might still need a BIOS update to do so. Again, there was no place we could download a manual or BIOS update, just a CD of drivers sent with the board. The solution here would be to buy a new motherboard that explicitly supports dual Xeon 2697 V2 CPUs. Since the motherboard, this one was the sketchiest link in the chain, a board we bought off AliExpress with no real BIOS updates available online, we ended up deciding to replace that one. We got a new board first. And we could have gone straight to server hardware, but we wanted something that could be argued as more gaming targeted. And so we picked up a board with a lot more PCIe slots. We also wanted something that might have some overclocking potential if we could break the Xeon lock, and uh, also something that looked a bit better than the, well, orange and black of this one. So in pursuit of this, we turned up one promising result, the EVGA SRX motherboard. The SRX was the follow-up to EVGA's popular SR2. SR stands for Super Record, and the older dual socket LGA 1366 board was a success among overclockers, especially EVGA resident overclocker Kingpin. We saw one in our recent tour of his lab, something he ran with seven LN2 pots in the day at a minimum, sometimes more for the RAM. And there was one for the chipset, two for the CPUs, four for the GPUs, and a lot to manage. It was the most complicated thing that Kingpin has ever managed for overclocking, he told us. And although he seemed to look back on it fondly, he also told us that he didn't miss the complexity. EVGA even put together a video called, quote, fastest system on planet Earth, that looks more like it's from the 90s than from 2010, but it does give perspective of how old the SR2 is these days. 
The SRX, though, came after that. Despite the SRX being locked now, all these years later, the SRX fit our needs perfectly, and the most recent BIOS revision specifically lists support for our CPUs. We contacted Jacob at EVGA and asked if he remembered the SRX, which was met with a sigh and a drawn out, yeah. For an idea of why that was the response, check out this 2012 overclock.net thread where he was trying to gently manage the expectations of excited overclockers before the launch. They had one board left, and it was an old RMA that had been sitting in the warehouse. He updated one of the three BIOSes on the board to the one that we needed and sent it over to us. Luckily, he didn't overwrite the BIOS that someone, either the RMA customer or an EVGA tech, had modded with a bad luck Brian macro. Top text, successfully makes BIOS skin. Bottom text, EVGA SRX. That's a pretty good summary of the reception this board got, if a bit depressing. We connected everything up as before and had the same postcode again, reserved for future use. So again, a couple potential culprits. The same issue could have been true as before with the engineering sample CPU, or this was a dud board. And that seemed unlikely given that it was failing exactly the same way as the other board. It boots fine with one CPU alone and it breaks with two, but still there must have been a reason it got RMA. So it was a possibility. And we really wanted to make this work. So we finally, we broke down and contacted Intel and asked if there could be a problem with running the engineering sample with a consumer sample CPU. And the answer was maybe. So after some back and forth with Intel having to find someone still who worked internally uh, who could also remember these CPUs, we did end up just getting a second sample from Intel that they happen to have lying around. Contrary to popular belief, Intel does not have stacks of CPUs on their desks to send out. So someone actually went and found this thing for us. And it's an SR19H CPU. It's a consumer CPU. So that would resolve what we thought was our last variable. We really wanted to make this work. Even though the 12-core Xeon is worse than cheaper Intel CPUs that are made today, like the 9900K, the point is that we wanted to use two of them in a cool motherboard with a case from a dead company and build an interesting computer. That's all we wanted when we started this. We reached out to EVGA again and were told that our postcode related to memory. Memory on the SRX is tricky. There are 12 slots, four per CPU, plus four extra on the primary CPU, and the filled slots are supposed to be mirrored between the two CPUs, which was complicated by the fact that we didn't have eight identical sticks of memory lying around. We began Googling solutions again and hit this forum thread that we can put on the screen of the EVGA forum from only a few months ago. Against all odds, two other people on the planet were having exactly the same problem. And hello to those of you who were. And they solved it. One of the accounts is seven years old and it's only made two posts, both in this thread from a few months ago. Apparently, even though these boards were fully intended to be compatible with non-ECC memory, and even though one CPU will boot with non-ECC memory, there is an issue that keeps pairs of E5 2697v2 CPUs, or possibly just Ivy Bridge EP CPUs in general, from booting with non-ECC memory. This is speculation, but it might be because the 2697v2 launched in quarter 3 2013, by which time it was well apparent that supporting the SRX was a waste of EVGA's time. We bought two RAM kits. First, a cheap four-stick kit of 1600 MHz memory just to make sure the board would boot, which it did, and then a 64 gigabyte eight-stick 1866 MHz kit. The SRX needs at least eight sticks to enable quad-channel memory, or well, quad-channel. The memory itself is, is not channel dependent, but quad channels on the motherboard is, uh, it needs eight sticks with the SRX, so four per CPU. At last, after multiple months, two motherboards, three CPUs, innumerable sticks of RAM, two power supplies, and at least three GPUs, we had found a combination of hardware that would work. Let's get into the testing, finally. We ran our standard series of CPU tests from March on the board. It's old data, keep in mind. Uh, and first, it was with four sticks of 1600 megahertz memory in dual channel on one board and using EVGA's default CL10 timings for the SRX, which are tighter than the sticks are rated for. Presumably, this was intended for non-ECC memory, but we tried it out anyway. And then we tested with the 1866 MHz quad configuration with CL13 timings as listed on these sticks. And then one last time with a 104 MHz BCLK. This was the best we could do for overclocking, sadly. So uh, that put us at 1940 MHz memory, EVGA's table of CL11 timings, and we would normally use a pair of, or well, our standard 2400 MHz HyperX kit for this testing on old boards, but it doesn't work because it's not ECC. 
So then, uh, raising the base clock beyond stock unfortunately breaks I.O. It actually breaks Ethernet. And uh, it breaks almost all of the USB ports as well. And also a lot of other things. So BCLK overclocking on this, not the best solution. But we tried it anyway. 104 megahertz for that. Let's get into the data, finally, and see if any of this was worth it. Our Blender benchmarks with the GN in-house made monkey head render is up first, giving us realistic workloads that leverage various effects within Blender. We haven't yet re-benchmarked any Intel X299 CPUs, and so the 2990WX has remained relatively uncontested at the top of this chart. Until now, that is, the 2697v2 by 2 configuration lands us at an impressive 13.2 minute render time with either of the two primary memory options. Blender really doesn't care much about memory latency and focuses entirely on core count, which is what we're seeing here. If we sacrifice our I.O. in favor of a higher B clock, we end up with a 12.6 minute render time. The 2990WX runs with just a 13.5% render time reduction, which, considering the tremendous age difference between these processors and the cost of two used 2697s, that's really not bad. This also positions the 2697v2x2's 132 minute render time as improved over the 9900K stock result by 36%, and over the 9900K OC 5.2 GHz result by 22%. In this instance, the 9900K board and CPU would cost less than the dual Xeon setup, and so does well to maintain proximity with its lower overall thread count and cost. Still, a used 2697v2 system is looking good in these initial tests. With the GN logo ray traced render, the 2697v2x2 has more difficulty keeping up with the 2990WX, now allowing the 2990WX a massive time requirement reduction of 49% versus the 2697v2 with the 1866 MHz memory configuration. This has to do with the complexity of the scene rendered, and is precisely why we use these longer render times and varied scene complexities for benchmarking. This allows us to better find where processors have weak and strong points, and for the 2697v2, it struggles in the GN logo render when using more modern instruction sets in Blender because, well, the 2697v2 doesn't have all of them. The 9900K ends up at 26 minutes for the render time, with the 2697v2 leading the modern i9, a family that didn't even exist when the 2697 launched, with a reduction of 31%. Given that we're running a total thread count three times higher than the 9900K, but with lower frequencies, this all makes sense. Blender wouldn't be a bad use case for a system like this, though you'd probably want to have a good lead on cheap parts or already have some of them in hand. Memory for these systems is low cost, thankfully, as we got 64 gigabytes for under $200, but it is slower DDR3. The potential upside is that it's also ECC which this processor supports, and which has value add for some users. For the right use case, given these Blender results, we have a promising start for a used dual CPU hot rod system. GCC code compile with Sigwin is next. We have some other tests that we'll publish shortly with MinGW, but these look at the Sigwin compile test of GCC for today's benchmark. We explain this test more in our workstation benchmarking methodology update that we published recently on the channel and on GamersNexus.net. The 2697v2x2 does well here, positioning itself in a highly competitive spot with the 2990WX modern era 30-core CPU. Although frequencies are much closer between these two than between the 2697v2 and the 9900K. The 2697v2x2 ended up completing the test in 4.6 minutes, allowing Threadripper's 4.3 minute result a time reduction of just 6.5%, or a 17% time reduction when using Core Prio. The 2697v2x2 result is hard to be mad at, though, because it's ahead of every other modern processor on the benchmarks, and that includes the 2700 at 4.2GHz and the 9900K, for reference. As for why AMD does so well here, we'll talk about that more in our separate piece exploring compile workload performance in our benchmarks. This is a great start for the 2697v2x2 system. For Blender and GCC, we clearly have some real use cases that aren't even forced, like a lot of other old system builds might be. Chaos Group's V-Ray is next. In this render workload, the 2697v2 fails to impress. Sadly, it does reasonably well, and for its time, it would have been among the best systems by a long shot. But age is showing, as the 9900K begins to match performance for cheaper and with better versatility and frequency-bound applications, like Photoshop or gaming. 
The 2697V2 overclocked with no I.O. functional, really, in the back of the board, takes 0.98 minutes, or about 59 seconds, to complete the render, with a 5.2 GHz 9900K completing the same workload in 0.95 minutes. The 2990WX holds a strong lead here, and it's probably time we rebench the X299 CPUs to give it some competition in the charts. The 2697V2 is ahead of the 9900K stock result, but the slow frequency of Intel's older processor is holding it back. Adobe Premiere is another one of our in-house workloads. We explain these tests in our CPU workstation methodology video. We use a 1080p 60H.264 RNG in code, which is a show floor report comprised entirely of A-roll and B-roll. And we also use a 4K 60 A-roll and B-roll review render. You can learn more about these settings in our methodology section in the previous article that was published with the video. The 1080p 60 convention shot render has the 9900K at 5.1 gigahertz, leading at 3.6 minutes to render. This would be further emboldened if enabling hardware encoding with the IGP, an option that Premiere added in the last two years, because this actually does boost performance in a noteworthy fashion. Still, even without it, we see Premiere's love for both threads and frequency in this benchmark. The 2697V2 does a lot better than we had expected, frankly, with a tied result when overclocked unsustainably to 104 BCLK, or a 3.78 minute result under stock conditions with 1866 MHz quad channel memory configured. Stepping down from quad channel to dual channel and 1600 MHz actually did hurt performance with a render time increase of 6.6%. Things change when we move to the 4K60 render, and the 2697V2 system, with both of its CPUs, actually manages to pull ahead of the 9900K both overclocked and stock, with the 2697 using 1860 MHz memory in quad channel configuration on the board. If we were to run a 9980XE through here, as we did last year in that review, it'd be the chart leader, but the cost goes up significantly for such a build. This shows that the 2697V 2x2 system could be reasonably used as a backup renderer for our office or other Premiere workloads. Photoshop is next. With Photoshop CC 2019, we use a mix of filters, transforms, scales, resizes, and effects applied to large images through Puget's benchmarking suite. Photoshop very clearly has a strong bias towards high-frequency processors, exhibited here in the 9900K's 5.2 GHz result, right alongside the 9700K's 5.1 GHz result. The fact that the 9700K can keep up clock for clock with a processor running twice the thread count helps illustrate Photoshop's propensity for leveraging frequency. It should come as no surprise, then, that the 2697V 2x2 system performs truly horribly in this workload. It's a letdown, really, as even the 1700 and the 8600K stock are outperforming it. The cores and threads just don't get used here. 7-zip is next and is measured in millions of instructions per second, with higher being better. Decompression is the first test, positioning the 2990WX in an incredible lead, although again uncontested by X299 at this time, with nearly 200,000 MIPS. The 2697V2 is the first processor we've run through this bench to approach the 2990WX, although the AMD Threadripper processor still holds a lead of about 51%. That stated, AMD does particularly well in decompression, so this will change with compression. The 9900K in the decompression workload is far behind the 2697V 2x2, showing that there is potentially another use case for this configuration, though you'd want to find the parts for cheap to be worthwhile. For reference, the 2700 at 4.2GHz ends up around just past the halfway mark, at 86,700 MIPS, and between the 2700X and 9900K at 5.2 GHz, with the stock 9900K below the 2700X stock CPU. The compression benchmark run really benefits the 2697V2, which is perfect for us. Aside from transcoding old video files into smaller formats, we can also use the 2697V2 system to compress archived test data or text files or images or anything else on the server into hopefully slightly smaller formats. This allows us to recover the data if we ever need it, especially those massive amounts of CSVs, but it allows us to keep it small enough that the footprint is minimized. With the 1866 MHz quad channel configuration, the 2697V 2x2 runs at 85,500 MIPS and boosts to 91,000 when B clock is pushed to 104 on the EBGA SRX. The Intel i9-9900K is next closest, with its 5.2 GHz run allowing the 2697V 2x2's a lead of 29%. Threadripper and the 2990WX end up toward the bottom of the charge, struggling to keep up in this more latency-intensive workload. 
Moving into games, we'll start to see the real deficit of the 2697V 2x2 systems in the modern age, and that's primarily going to be frequency. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p posts the 2697V 2x2 at 90fps average, with lows reasonably well spaced at 60fps and 50fps, 1% and 0.1% lows. The downside, though, is that it's doing worse than even an R5 2600. Don't get us wrong, the R5 2600 is a good CPU, but it's also $154 and 12 threads. The 2697's older architecture, slower frequencies, and dated memory are holding the two CPUs back. And besides, it's not like games play particularly well with high core count CPUs or dual socket systems to begin with, as the 2990WX high core count CPU, both stock and with core prio, illustrates clearly in this very benchmark. GTA 5 at 1080p is next. At 1080p, the GTA 5 benchmark positions the Intel E5 CPUs at the very bottom of the chart, far, far away from anything else at all. They're bad. Really bad. GTA 5 just does not like this combination of hardware to the extent that you'd be much better off buying probably an i3 at the high end, but definitely an i5 or r5 for this game, like the 2600 or 8600K, both of which are also in the process of aging. That said, this is clearly not a build meant for gaming. It's just not one that you'd necessarily want to even game on, uh, even on the side. It may be better to go with a second system for that task if doing something like this. Uh, or disabling one of the CPUs when gaming. 1440p doesn't help things here, despite pushing the load onto the GPU. The 2697v 2x2 still runs under 60fps average here, with the R7 1700 positioned far ahead at just 75fps average, and that's not even a great result on this chart. As discussed in our CPU methodology update for games, Civilization VI has gotten enough updates that it has routinely wiped our dataset for testing. Civ 6 testing uses turn times instead of FPS, looking at the time requirement for AI to process a single turn. Note that with more AI players, longer turns would start to add up significantly, so this is a useful metric to understand. The 2697v 2x2 system does poorly here, with a 56 second turn time requirement on the 1866 MHz quad channel configuration. There isn't even much test variance here, it's just 55 seconds for all 15 of the turns completed, and this means that with five AI players, you'd be waiting nearly five full minutes for your next turn, which is agonizing in a turn-based strategy game. The 9900K takes about 30 seconds per turn, with the 9700K at 5.1 gigahertz taking a similar amount of time. There's a lot of value to frequency in this benchmark, which is made clear by the firm division between AMD and Intel in the chart, where higher frequency Intel parts always take the lead. The 2697v2 is a low frequency part though, and also oddly configured for games in the two socket build, making it overall a poor choice for this game. For Total War Warhammer 2 and the battle benchmark, the Intel E5 2697v 2x2 sadly performed nearly the worst on the charts once again, landing at under 60 FPS average. This puts it far below the 1700, which was the previous slowest processor on the benchmark. The 2990WX does much worse, to be fair, at under 20 FPS average when stock. This game really hates the 2990WX, but turning game mode on and disabling half the cores helps significantly. We have more games that we've tested, but we'll leave it here. It's the same story repeated across the next four games, with the 2697V 2x2 build always performing among the worst on the charts. This is obviously a workstation build anyway, so that's okay for our purposes. So that's the build. Uh, for the gaming tests, obviously it's not the best. For Handbrake, which we didn't include here, for our transcoding, it's really good. So we just run Handbrake in the background all the time. It's a lot faster than the 8086K's overclocks we used to run it on because it actually leverages the CPUs. And there's 24 threads on each CPU. So we've got 48, we can run Handbrake and compress the hell out of our videos that we, we uh, don't want taking up all of our space when it's uh, just B-roll files and stuff. And it works out very well for that, actually. But it, uh, again, you'd be better off with modern parts that are about the same price after you count all of the various things we had to buy or ask for to do this. Um, but it was still a lot of fun, and we still want to do more with this. So we have some ideas for custom modifying the enclosure or at least doing a cool liquid cooling build in it. And we'll talk about that more later. Also, uh, I was told while filming this, by our uh, Chinese teacher that the name means South China Gold, or maybe South China Gold Metal, depending on how you interpret it. So anyway, that's, that's what that company is. Thank you for watching. Let us know if you find this kind of, I don't even know what it is, restoration content interesting. We might do more of it. Subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus or store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly where we have the new toolkit. I'll see you all next time.